for your support. Um, and so I think that is all the intros. And like I said, we'll probably have some folks hopping in um, uh, over the course of the hour we're together. But I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenter. So Daniel, you are up first. So hi, everyone. Um, we basically, Ethany and I have kind of like 15, 20 minutes to kind of go through quick laser bullet some ideas. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of basically, if you're on the screen, I am going to share just one Kickstarter campaign that I recently worked on last year. Um, and for those who aren't on a screen, I will just talk you through it. <laughs> so I'm going to just share and I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, oh, that's Ethany. Hi, Ethany. I was trying to figure out what was happening. Um, there we go. Is everyone looking at a page called called up a new artwork for Kansas City? Okay, I'm seeing people nod their heads. Great. Um, so like I said, I work sort of in the arts category at Kickstarter that is primarily working in art and photography. And a lot of projects we get in those range anywhere from fundraising for an exhibition to doing a photo book to um, a mural a social practice based project, basically anything. Um, and we tend to say projects that end up being the most successful are things that feel that they centered around uh, a project itself. So a specific thing you're trying to do that usually has a timeline, i.e. it's going to happen at a certain point and you probably have a space for it. Basically with Kickstarter, anyone can really launch a project. It's a public platform, um, but the ones that end up telling the most successful uh, stories are those that feel the most compelling um, and those that usually feel the most urgent. So with Ebony's project, she is a Jamaica and Kansas, uh, or excuse me, um, I think Nashville based artist. Um, she works in the intersection of kind of drawing and installation and sculpture. She was invited to do a participatory project in Kansas City. Um, they gave her a budget as most artists have, but the budget wasn't enough as most artists face. Um, and she wanted to do a project that actually not only was for the duration of Open Spaces, which was a six month exhibition that happened all across the city of Kansas City, um, but she also wanted to raise funds so that she could install benches uh, permanently and then give additional funds back to the actual parks department where her installation was uh, to be able to maintain the site if they so uh, desired. So her project was basically reclaiming one of America's um, first desegregated public pools. Um, there are actually two pools in Swope Park. One is open, one is not. And she chose to revitalize the one that was not. So already, right, we have a project that is telling a really compelling story that feels like it's uplifting a history and a narrative um, that, that matters. And as you can see, she's got pictures in here that what, what it was before and what it was after. Um, there's a little bit about her, some of her past work, but I really encourage people to, if you're thinking about doing a crowdfunding campaign, think about it in basically two very large steps. One step, which is like, what do I actually need to do to get it on the site? That's usually a project text, it's usually images, um, and then it's also the rewards, then there's usually an introduction or two minutes max. It does not have to be a huge thing. Um, but thinking through those actual parts is really important. And if you really honestly just go to Kickstarter and you find uh, projects we love, that's usually a project that we have worked on or that we're excited about. And I highly encourage people to look through these lists and see what's actually funding and what's working. So. There's a current example that's live right now with the artist Jackie Summel. Um, she's taking one of her projects on the road in a truck. And just really, if you want to, look through and see how are they writing the text? What prices are they doing for their rewards? What rewards are working well and selling out? And then also what rewards are not working? This is a great way for you to kind of get a refresher by just going on the site and seeing what's live and using that as kind of a, an example and a template. Um, most of them that I work on, right, I always recommend having some. So who are you? 
Um, what will your contribution support, uh, which is basically what's your budget? Uh, why are you using Kickstarter in the first place? Why are you crowdfunding in the first place? Um, these are all great kind of tools to essentially build trust. Um, and all the time I'm thinking about how can this campaign build trust and accountability, not only with the people that basically already know you and are signed up, um, but are people who probably are brand new to you and have no idea who you are. It's a great way to essentially reintroduce something that you're doing or introduce something that's brand new and invite people into your community. So it's kind of like one section, right? Building the actual project itself. The other half that I think everyone sort of kind of highlighted um, when they introduced themselves is like, well, how do I actually get the backer? <laughs> people um, I've got a ton of <laughs> it's a it's a laundry list um, some of them that I've pulled out for you and I'm going to actually stop sharing right now um, and kind of just walk through these so you can write them down and think through them um, these are kind of like very great ways on the ground level to think through very beginning like who is am I actually going to do outreach for so the first step I always say for people is uh, really start with sort of a stakeholder map. Um, it's kind of borrowing sort of from public policy language, um, but a stakeholder map is really, it can be as simple as a drawing, uh, or it can be a list of every single person that's connected to the actual project itself, right? So if you're crowdfunding for, say, Ebony's project, um, that is a site-specific installation for a duration of time and a city. So for Ebony, who does she know in Kansas City? Who does she know who is tied to the history of the space? Who does she know that is uh, uh, maybe a swimmer, maybe someone who has uh, done a memorial before, someone who has done a site that revitalizes? Um, if she's working with florists, which is part of her installation, uh, what people does she know in the city that own a flower shop? Can she work with them? These are great ways to just start thinking uh, about person, about essentially really building a tree that you're then going to rely on for the duration of the campaign. Um, the second step with those is usually thinking through them, and of course it could just be a friend on your stakeholder map if they're part of the project itself, but it's good to think through the next step of what are they good at? And identifying what they're good at is usually a great way to then hone your ask in. Because what I don't want people doing is emailing their friends and saying, Hey, I'm doing a project. It's not really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think we lost you for a second. Tell your friend, hey, I'm going to do a Kickstarter. Oh, am I here? Okay, you you're there. now? Yes, we got you. Got it. Great. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so when you're uh, asking someone to be part of the Kickstarter project, it's good to already think in advance what you think their strength is and what they can bring to the table. So that can range from as easy as, um, say you know a collector or benefactor, you can approach them before the campaign is live, tell them about the project and say, I think this $500 reward that is a limited edition, a print of mine, uh, you would love because you've always wanted one of my works and this is a great time to support the project. It can also, on the total end of the spectrum, be uh, a person who doesn't have any financial means to help the project. You can also think through, okay, does that person have a newsletter? Does that person have space to throw a party? Social media channels, mm -hmm. and which one is the best? Which one are they most active on? Um, maybe not even necessarily which one has the most followers, but which social media channel are they using that they feel really active and part of? And then, right, taking that stakeholder map, doing that a little bit analysis, and then approaching those people before the campaign's even launched, it essentially builds them in on like they're in on a secret, really. They're in on something that's going to be exciting, um, and, they, and you want them to play a part. Because of course, most of the people who are going to support you day one, they're going to be your friends, they're going to be your family members, they want to help you. So giving them the tools and also giving them a little bit of a direction as to where you think they would be best suited to help is usually the best. Um, some other things that I have actually been personally doing for my own work. Um, two things. Uh, one, do a little research.
research on how to download uh, recent Gmail contacts. This is actually relatively simple, um, but getting kind of an Excel sheet going of just emails is really, really important, especially if you don't have a newsletter already. If you're going to crowdfund, uh, newsletters are definitely one of the best tools because it's a great way to shout out to the people who really love you the most to give them benchmarks essentially sending a newsletter to these people of i'm going to launch this tomorrow i want you to be part of it all the way to we have two days left we already hit our goal but there's a few rewards left and i'd love for everyone to be part of it um so thinking through gmail thinking through your inbox um working through who have i like recently shot an email to and again pretty much doing the same thing as you did to a stakeholder map thinking through uh Oh, they would get that $25 reward. They would love the $5 keep notified. They would love the $1,000 artwork. They're all great ways to feel it, make it feel a little bit more personal for them. Um, the second tip that I have really loved and seen work very well recently is going through your personal phone and looking at the past 100 people you've texted. Um, this is shockingly super, super effective. Um, if you've got like an iPhone, a Kickstarter campaign will auto load. It will be really pretty and it will drag the main image that you've picked um, onto the phone screen. So it, the Kickstarter campaigns almost look as if they're a press piece on people's phones. Um, so if you just honestly, it's like take 30 minutes to work through your phone and go, oh, that person would give $5. That person would totally give 10. That person probably won't give, but they will definitely include it in their newsletter. And honestly, just shoot them a text. It makes kind of the work that you're essentially distributing to other people feel really, really fast. Because again, thinking through, the people who are going to support you are people that are probably the most close to you and they want to help you. So making that bar of work very easy and also very simple for them and streamlined is a great way for them to basically click the link, grab a reward for $10, post it on, um, Instagram and say, hey, done, so excited, great. Mm -hmm. That took 30 seconds. <laughs> it's super efficient, um, mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. So to um, kind of wrap up basically, right, to think about crowdfunding campaigns, you do have two sort of buckets of work that you need to work through. One of them is thinking through, okay, what are the actual raw materials that I need to do on a Kickstarter campaign? The text, the rewards, the images, the video, um, and looking through past examples of seeing what's working, what's not, what on the site makes a lot of sense, um, what people's videos are, are their texts bilingual, do their videos have closed captioning, these are all things to just kind of pay attention to and, and go, okay, this would resonate well for my project, and I know my community would, would love it if I had tons of past images, or really accessible rewards, um, that's one bucket. The second bucket is again, thinking through this kind of outreach plan, starting with that stakeholder map and thinking, okay, who are the people closest to me that are part of this project? What are their best skills? How can I ask that? And then from there, build an outreach plan that includes a newsletter. It might include personal emails. Um, it might be texting people, um, but it's all ways to think a little bit more thoughtfully about sharing it. Because again, you don't want us, you don't want to be in a space where you're just blindly sending it out to the world. You want to give a little bit direction uh, to people to make them feel like you've thought about them and that you also really do want them to be part of the project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really it. That was like a lot of information. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> But of course, we're here, like, you know, both of us are here and the Lodger Met Project is here if you've got, uh, both Anthony and I are here if you've got questions afterwards. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and yay for that. I think I'm going to steal that um, uh, download from the Gmail email contacts, uh, which I've never done before, but super, yeah. super easy to do. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and Anthony, we will turn it over to you now. 
Okay, hi again, everybody. Um, I am also getting a message about unstable internet on this end. I don't know. The weather uh, probably is. I know. Is, Somehow, yeah. when it rains, like it rains on the internet, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's weird. But uh, it's unstable. So just yes. Wave at me if, uh, <laughs> if I freeze or something. Um, but hi again, everyone. Again, my name is Ethany, um, Partnerships Manager here at IUB. And I like visuals, so I grabbed a few slides for tonight. I'm just going to try to share my screen here. All right. Okay. All right. So is everybody seeing a slide with like some happy people in yellow t-shirts? Mm -hmm. cool. Um, so IOB, uh, for folks on the line um, who might not be familiar with us, um, stands for In Our Backyards. Um, we are a 501c3 um, nonprofit that helps residents to fundraise for positive change in their communities. Um, in Our Backyards is our like positive reversal of the infamous NIMBY or not in my backyard. Um, so we're a platform for people who are um, funding projects that make them and their neighbors say, yes, this is something positive that we want to create together in our collective backyards. Um, so our work here at IOB is really around um, lifting up resident leadership, um, which can take lots of different forms, but it's really based in a deep belief of um, the idea that residents know best what their communities need. Um, and our best position to be the stewards of long-term change um, in our communities. Um, so uh, just a little bit more context about us. We work nationally. Um, I'm talking to you from our Brooklyn office. We also have offices in Cleveland, Memphis, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. Um, and um, our platform is really tailored for uh, grassroots um, and nonprofit projects that have an aspect of public benefit to them. Um, some of those, of course, can include arts projects, um, but also a wide range of other projects. Um, and we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to everybody who fundraises with us um, uh, and have designed the IOB platform in a variety of ways to be just like a support for um, projects led by, by grassroots civic leaders. Um, through things like um, offering tax deductions for every IOB campaign, fiscal sponsorship um, as needed um, to make those tax deductions possible. Um, uh, we have a feature where you can add a button to your page um, to seek volunteers as well as donors. We have what is in crowdfunding speak, sometimes called a flexible finish policy, where you can always keep what you raise, because um, particularly with volunteer-led projects, like things change a lot, um, so we like to allow for that. Um, and we also work with a variety of um, funding partners around the country um, to offer um, double your dollar match funding opportunities um, for specific kinds of projects. So that's my wheelhouse at IOB is directing those programs. So that's just a little bit about us. Um, and you guys had sent along this great list of uh, questions to t for tonight, so I just grabbed some, uh, some content I can share related to those questions, but you had also suggested sharing a crowdfunding campaign. So I wanted to lift up um, this project, We Run Brownsville, um, because I think a lot of what they've done uh, we can all learn from um, and sort of they follow a lot of best practices for in their crowdfunding practice um, that we can all learn from. So We Run Brownsville is um, a really great project out of Brownsville, Brooklyn, um, led by two um, residents of Brownsville who also happen to be passionate uh, runners um, and their program is a free walk run uh, fitness training program for women in Brownsville. Um, the name is a little bit of a double entendre because their group is also really not just about fitness. They're also really creating community, creating safe spaces, um, fighting systemic injustices in their communities and building community power. 
um, so that their residents there can help run Brownsville. Um, so really great project, we love them. They've raised about $25,000 over the past couple years through multiple smaller crowdfunding campaigns. Um, and some of the things that they always do really well in their campaigns uh, are listed here. They do a great job of enabling other people to um, spread the word for them and echo their message and get the word out on their behalf, enable those cheerleaders. Um, they always use multiple outreach strategies. So you'll see them posting on social media and you'll get an email from them and they'll be tabling at the community event. Um, they really uh, do a great job of kind of reaching out to everyone in their network. Um, they always have a great use of suggested giving amounts um, on their page, which is something we always recommend. Um, and they're really good at thanking and sending good thank yous. So just, um, some more, uh, a little more to flesh out all of those points with enabling cheerleaders. Um, so uh, on the screen here, what you're seeing is a screenshot of somebody promoting their campaign on Facebook. Um, and then also a screenshot of uh, the content that they were essentially sending out to people during their campaigns to make it easy for people to post on social media for them. Um, so prepping that language so they can, and sending it to people so they can control the messaging around their campaign um, and also just make it really easy for people to post on their behalf. Um, screenshot here is of their suggested gift amounts from one of their campaigns. Um, unlike Kickstarter, which uh, is, is, is definitely the platform you want to go with if you are offering um, rewards, on IOB it complicates the tax deduction, so we usually push people towards doing a suggested giving amount instead. Um, but we do encourage doing that, putting a dollar amount um, into the mind of the um, person you're reaching out to can be a powerful way to challenge them to maybe give at a level that uh, is meaningful to your project. Um, you can also do a lot of creative free things around gift amounts. One of my favorite uh, gifts for an IOB campaign ever was run by a community garden that had this like very charismatic chicken at the garden and everybody loved this chicken. <laughs> um, and if you gave at a certain level, you could come by the garden and get your picture taken with this chicken and they would like post it on Facebook and tag you in it so all your friends would know you gave and were a community chicken loving person. Um, so it kind of like blew up. Everybody wanted their photo with this chicken. Um, it was really creative engagement for them. So you can have fun with suggesting these amounts too. Um, we were in Brownsville used multiple outreach strategies I mentioned. So the screenshot here is of some language they used actually for letters to go out to local businesses. Letters seem like so super old school. We think of crowdfunding happening more like online, on social media, et cetera. Um, but depending on your donor base, it might make sense to like mix it up with some offline asks too. And we see that a lot in different communities. And then finally, we run Brownsville, so good at saying thank you. I personally am shocked uh, at how many people forget to say thank you at the end of a successful crowdfunding campaign. Um, so this is just a, a screenshot of a post from their page on one campaign. Um, they would also, of course, email thank yous out to everybody. Um, and they're really great at doing the immediate thank you when you give to one of their campaigns and really great at using that as a thank you and, like thank you so much for your donation and please let your friends know about our campaign. Please post this language on your Facebook page to tell everyone you gave, et cetera. Um, so that thank you and can be a big, uh, powerful factor for getting kind of that ripple effect of reaching some new donors who aren't in your immediate network. Um, so kind of like Daniel was talking about uh, it's, I think, a most important starting point with crowdfunding is always to just kind of know who your donors are, actually take that time to sit down and plan, like, who are the people that you're actually going to be reaching out to? Um, maybe that's just a list you brainstorm, or maybe that's a drawing, like the, the network map. Um, 
but if it helps to frame that brainstorm, here's some uh, ways you can, can think about it when you're trying to put pen to paper. Uh, we would encourage you to think about reaching out to people who are A, able to give um, at some level, might be, and Daniel was also mentioning this, might be the case that they're able to give something else to your work or your project besides cash. Maybe they would be a great volunteer or cheerleader or fundraising teammate or have a skill they can bring to the table. Um, but people are just able to give something that is useful to this work that you're trying to support. Um, you're going to want to focus on people that you know or at least think are probably already bought into what you're doing that already kind of like aligns with something that they're interested in um, and then see um, you are going to want to start with people who are connected to you in some way and that could just literally be like anyone you have the ability to get contact information for um, or can get in front of them because they're on the readership of a newsletter that you can get posted in etc um, whatever those connections are um, another way you can think about framing that brainstorm um, is thinking about some of the big reasons why people give to crowdfunding campaigns. Um, so you might brainstorm one bucket of people that's like people who would give because they love you. They don't even care that much about what you're asking them for money for. They're just going to give because it's you that's asking. Right? Um, so that might be like friends and family networks typically. Um, you might also have a bucket of people that are people actually impacted um, by the project you're doing. People who you know, will have some benefit to actually seeing that project happen. Maybe it's in their community, maybe they get to participate in it. Um, that can be a key group of people to reach out to. Um, or there might, other, there might be folks who you don't know that well, they're not necessarily giving because you're the one asking, but it seems like you could get them to be passionate about your project or um, for example uh, if you're working on something in the arena of uh, food justice there's a lot of food justice groups um, across the country and here in New York that you might be connected to people you know through those networks um, might already be kind of primed to give to something that connects to that interest um, so once you have some sense of who those donors are that you're going to be reaching out to. Um, then you can start to think um, in real terms about what might be the best way to reach them. Um, I think this is very not one size fits all. Um, we have IOB campaigns that are like entirely funded on social media because the project leader is like, has a big following, is very active on social media. That's the primary way they're connected with the people they think are likely to give. We have other IOB campaigns that happen almost entirely offline, where people are just like talking to folks in person, getting their email address and sending them a follow-up, or like tabling at community events and swiping donations on the spot with a square device. So this can look really, really different depending on what your own donor, potential donor network looks like. Um, but in general, you're going to want to th probably think about using a mix of strategies um, of emails, personalizing them, of course, is always great and more effective. Um, social media, agree with Daniel that newsletters can be awesome. Um, phone calls can be awesome, or even those in-person asks, people that you're running into in the community. Um, it's a great chance to ask, presenting at meetings, that kind of thing. Um, and depending on the project you're doing, you might also be seeking press related to your project or your campaign. Um, and then somebody had had the question about um, momentum, keeping up momentum during the campaign. Um, we're like huge fans of planning here at IOB. Um, we really push the planning tools before you start fundraising. Because um, one of the things that can really keep up momentum is like, knowing what communications you're planning to send and when you're planning to send them and already like having that plan sketched out um, so that once you hit go on your fundraising campaign, you can kind of just like run down that drill. Um, we also recommend uh, when you have your list of potential donors and you're looking at that list, there will be some people on that list where you are like, oh, I know they'll give. 
it feels easier to ask them than to ask like these people that I haven't been in touch with for three years or whatever. Um, so easy, doing those easier asks first um, can be a great way to like show some early momentum in your fundraising um, so that everybody else who doesn't know you as well is likely to jump on board after that. Um, also, it's a great confidence builder for you to do some of those easy asks first. Um, and then for momentum, we would also recommend uh, changing up your content a little bit through the campaign. You don't want to be hitting people with like the same email over and over again, like please give to my crowdfunding campaign. Um, you know, so sharing different messages about why you're excited about this work, maybe different behind the scenes photos or different stories, whatever that is, um, to just kind of keep that content fresh. And you can kind of amp up the urgency of that as your fundraising deadline nears. Um, and then there had also been a question about kind of tone to use with this. Um, and I think that really depends on what you're fundraising for. Um, but uh, depending on an, uh, fundraising for laundromat project, for example, I would think the tone could be uh, somewhat celebratory. Um, other projects you're working on or things that are like responding to a crisis in your community, of course, might have a much more serious tone. Either way, I think it's important to just kind of share the urgency of whatever you're fundraising for, share your passion about it, um, and to get comfortable telling the story about your story of why you think people should give to this and really let yourself sound like you, not like some idea of what you think a fundraiser should sound like. Um, and I think that authenticity can really help build trust and get people on board. And I'm just about out of time, but I think that was my last thing. There's my contact input if anybody wants it. Thanks all so much. I'll go back on mute here for questions and stop my screen share. Is this is this question time? Oh, no, I, I think she's on mute. mute. On mute. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <you> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Uh, so anybody will do this popcorn style, whatever format popcorn style takes. Yep. Go for Can it. I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Ethany, you mentioned the these those four stages in that slideshow of keeping up momentum from the announcement to the last chance, and I totally understand what the announcement and the last chance would look like. But um, could you give me some examples or expand on what it, like the celebration and the urgency builder would look like? Sure. Yeah, and that's. Um, screenshot was just taken from um, our uh, like more in-depth thing in our leader toolkit um, so I can also have send that out to everybody if folks are interested in more detail on that um, but the celebratory message referred to in that screenshot um, is intended to be like say when you hit your 25% or 50% mark on your campaign um, is a great time to to kind of celebrate that and um, share kind of share that message of like hey people are jumping on board with this like we're on track towards our goal which can help with the human psychology of like other people wanting to jump on board um, and then an, an urgency builder would be like maybe as you head into say the last 25 percent of your campaign where it's not like the last day to give but you're starting to kind of ramp up that sense of urgency of like please give soon Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Aaron. I can jump in with a quick question if that's all right. Uh, hello? Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Hey. Um, first, I want to thank, thank you, Laundromat, and uh, thank you to the two speakers. Really informative and really helpful. I was thinking, you know, um, about sending out, you know, what I'll be doing for the LP and their people power challenge and I have a lot of contacts in New York people in New York who may have heard of the laundromat project but I also have a lot of contacts in Chicago and LA and thinking about how to engage people in other cities who may not be directly affected by the campaign um, obviously I would still think about people who love art and people who love change and people who like me or trust me but is there 
uh, other sort of tools and tips you might have for reaching people that are directly affected or maybe live in other cities? Um, let me start. I, I can, I have a few ideas. So I think um, if, so with that specific advice to, and also in general with Kickstarters, we almost always recommend having rewards uh, that are say acknowledgement based. Um, so those are great ways to get people excited that may physically not even go see the thing that you're fundraising for, um, but they want to be part of it. So this logic is kind of like some of the rewards we say are like name in a brochure, name on the website, social media shout out, um, to as large as if you're doing an exhibition, it can be like name on the gallery wall. Um, these are ways of essentially you're using the, the sort of like reward, sort of like carrot stick as a way to get people excited, even if you know and they know you're never going to go actually see the thing itself. Um, I've also definitely found um, if there's a geographic distance, hitting those people up a little bit after the people who have, um, like Ethany had said, like the people who love you and gave day one, a little bit after that, showing it to people that are farther out uh, gives them that visual indication because right, all they're seeing is probably your voicemails, um, your texts or whatever's online and showing that, that it's like doing really well. And we've already got 30 people in the program. We've already got 40 backers. It builds that bandwagon effect of like, oh, I'm, oh, like, oh all my friends are doing it. I should do it too. So that's a second. I, I would do. I would start with those two and see if they work. I can um, actually hop in and offer one other thing, um, Aaron, in that regard. Um, uh, passively uh, inserting myself into it as well. Um, but it's one of those things. I, I think it's also uh, putting the work in context. So where it is, LP, for example, is very place based where in New York City, the issues that we uh, work around, facilitate, um, uh, or the issues that people are dealing with are not necessarily unique to New York City. So mm -hmm. gentrification is taking place in New York, it's taking place in LA, it's taking place all across the US. So figuring out connectivity moments and points where you can take the local issue and broaden it out and, and put it on a more international scale, um, I think is a good way uh, just to show people this is what's happening here, this is how we're supporting here, but the issue doesn't stop here. So making sure that something that comes up through, through your messaging and finding connectivity points and moments, I think I can offer that as well, something to consider when you're thinking about reaching out to folks who aren't here in the city. Well, thank you both. Um, I have one question for uh, Daniel. Um, so on that point about um, geography and rewards, um, I'm kind of curious if there are any rewards that are not a good idea, because it might be too local like say like entrance to a specific venue or like location if that's not a good idea or say like offering like food or baked goods as like yeah. a reward i guess yeah. there's some good like call outs of like what not to do so um i actually love this i have a whole laundry list of rewards not to do um and they're uh, uh, the funny thing is is that it's almost kind of like opposite of what you're thinking so okay. the 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 less the rewards feel personal, the less they feel exciting. And also usually the higher they end up costing. Um, so those are rewards that are like, I call them merch rewards. So like t-shirt, tote bag, hat, these are all things that feel a little bit impersonal. Um, and also quite frankly, their production costs can sometimes spike up if you don't like reach that threshold of you need 200 people to get the t-shirt and then suddenly the t-shirts cost double the amount. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cost money suddenly. Uh, so those are, I tend to say avoid uh, rewards that make your project feel like a gift shop. Um, and instead, I've actually found a ton of success in, pro in rewards that do feel super localized. So uh, like one of our artists right now, Kim Bui Olujimi, he had a reward totally sell out that was literally like family dinner with Kambui. Um, and it was like, I'll barbecue, we'll have my friend who's a guest chef come over, just come over to my house and we'll hang out. And people loved it because they love him, they love the project and they wanna hang out with him. 
So I've actually seen the more personal you get, and sometimes the more localized you get, um, the more it feels like that person feels like that rewards for them. Because again, it's building that like, oh, I want to do that. That sounds really cool. Um, and again, so if like if it's a reward, if if like a half of your community is not in the city, engage them in like acknowledgement based way, or what is one thing that I can ship pretty cheap for like you know a really simple print that's like eight and a half by eleven that you can print a hundred of them for two bucks and you can ship in a flat file and that takes half a day. Um, but yeah, I I would actually say the more personal and the more kind of like come grab a beer with me, let's do a barbecue, I'll do a studio visit with you. Um, usually the people closest to you get more, actually more excited about that. Cool, thank you. Yeah. I keep forgetting I'm on mute, sorry. Um, I do have one question um, uh, from Amelia. Um, and what are, uh, to both Daniel and Anthony, what are your pro tips on easy mistakes that can happen, kind of things to avoid? Anthony, do you want to take this one? And then I'll go after. Sure, yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, so I would say one thing you want to be, want to avoid is um, being, the three words that come to mind to me for me are that you should avoid being vague, mm. um, being impersonal, or being repetitive. Um, so I think the more specific you can be about like what are you fundraising for, like what will this donation you're asking for help make happen in the world? I think that is always great to be sure. It's that that's like super clear. Um, maybe like have somebody who's not familiar with what you're fundraising for, proofread your page before you put it out there. Be sure the story that you're telling um, is really clear to people who aren't already familiar with the project. Um, and then the more you can personalize your asks reaching out, the better. I see a lot, a lot of crowdfunding campaigns get stuck because of this idea that you can kind of just like post it on your Facebook feed like over and over again and without like tagging anyone or messaging anyone or making it more personal in any way and it just doesn't work so the more you can personalize emails or social media posts etc the better or rewards like Daniel was saying um, and I think again just like interesting content kind of like changing it up a little bit throughout your campaign um, can go a long way too. Um, yeah, I, Anthony, I love the idea of personalizing. That just tends to work the best. So like, I say a, a tool that people tend to forget about are like just the power of a personal email, which can literally be three sentences. It can be similar to the text that you've sent to people, but uh, maybe they're a little bit more pro of a professional contact. And so you want to approach them in a little bit more of a professional way. Um, the email can be like, Hi, Dean. Hope you're well. So great seeing you last week. I j I'm about to launch this really cool project. Um, here's the link. Um, it's going live 10 a.m. on Thursday. I think you would love the $75 reward because you said you were interested in my work. Let me know if you have questions. Best X. Um, and see, even in that email example I gave, I didn't even say a crowdfunding campaign. You just simply said, I'm doing an exciting new project or like, hey, just letting you know, here's the link to that project that I talked about. And when they get to it, of course, they're gonna see it's a crowdfunding campaign. Um, but what they are gonna be excited about is knowing that you have been personally like drawn from the email sphere. <laughs> Even like social media DMs too, like Instagram DMs work great. Um, so the more personal, the better. Um, and the only other thing I had to add to that to avoid, um, this is just kind of like verb choice, but I've really seen uh, the call to action be stronger if you really avoid language that is, please help me, or please donate, or help me now. Um, sometimes that sense of urgency can feel a little bit like, help me, um, and it comes from a space of like, almost desperation. Um, so instead, 
moving it as far away from that as possible and thinking of using verbs that are like, join our community, uh, this is our project for us together, I want you to be part of this story with me. Those feel way more inclusive and also frames the Kickstarter or any crowdfunding campaign as a way of like actively engaging on a project. Because of course, right, they are just giving you $5, but that $5 is telling a story and it's making an impact and they're there for the ride. Um, so yeah, I definitely wanted to pinpoint that one for sure. Just thinking about the kind of verbs that you're using, the, the sort of like ask verbs, make them feel really strong and powerful. There's one other thought I'd love to insert kind of related to the idea of things to avoid I would, is, or something not to do. I would say just don't be afraid to ask more than once. Oh yeah. Um, and I experienced this personally not too long ago when I gave to a Kickstarter campaign actually for a local Brooklyn art space here that I had, you know, I'd signed up on their mailing list at some point and even given them my phone number at some point. Um, but they were doing like a really ambitious campaign. I was like seeing it on social media and was like, oh, that's cool. Maybe I'll give to that. And I didn't because like we're busy and there's a lot of noise online. And then I got an email from them and was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's cool. I'll give to that. And then I did it. <laughs> um, and then towards their end of their campaign, they were doing like a phone banking night and one of their volunteers actually called me and was like, you know, I got this like voicemail from them that was like, we really need your donation. And I was like, oh yeah, they were now, I know they really need like me. And like finally sat down and got out the credit card and did it. Um, so I would, that's just like my personal plug for uh, not being discouraged if people don't give immediately. A lot of times it might just be because they're busy and need to be invited into this multiple times at the right moment. I'm, I'm so curious as to who that was. <laughs> it, was uh, it was Mayday Space up in oh, yeah. Bushwick. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I say like max email people three times if you don't know them, four or five times if you do. So like if you've sent someone an email week one and they haven't gotten back, it's probably just buried, right? It's not that they like, like don't care about you, it's just buried. So sending another wave and then sending another wave, usually, you know, yeah, it does give you that kind of like, oh yeah, I have to do that. <laughs> awesome, so we are actually right on time. It is eight o'clock, look at that efficiency. Um, this is awesome. And so I guess if there are any other questions, um, I'll go ahead and just for the sake of time, wrap up because I know this conversation can go on and on. We'll probably sit here for a full day plus um, talking about this particular topic. But thank you both so much um, for sharing.